the summer was amazing when hip hop was in its early days. You can go to different parks, Olinville Park, the Valley, you know, and just hear these amazing crews put out this new stuff that was the coolest thing out. One life, one passion, one focus. You're listening to the On The One Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Donaldson. In the spirit of this episode, you can call me by my hip-hop name. Dollar feel, y'all. When a significant cultural innovation occurs, it's usually surrounded by a myriad of influential factors. They can be creative, sociological, political, and even meteorological. They say that necessity is the mother of invention, but I would add that passion gets it done, along with a bit of serendipity. Such is the case with the first wave of hip hop. What began in 1970s Bronx with a neighborhood of passionate and determined teenagers has become a global phenomenon. My guest today made his bones as Mexi Ray with his crude touch of class and the nice and nasty MCs. He was at ground zero of a cultural explosion fueled by passion that combined graffiti, DJing, MCing, b-boying, and beatboxing and set the world afire. So grab your kangals and kazals as we get the skinny on hip-hop history. It's time to get down on the one. My next guest is a community leader, MC, producer, entrepreneur, devoted husband, and father. He grew up in the Boogie Down Bronx and was present as a cultural revolution was taking place in the form of East Coast hip hop. In 2006, he opened the Hip Hop Culture Center in Harlem and hosted the first 24 hour rapathon. They also had some youth education programs and much more. Harlem knows him, and I'm happy to welcome Curtis Sherrod to the On the One podcast. Curtis, thanks so much for taking the time out to talk hip-hop. Thank you, thank you. You far too kind. So take us back to the beginnings, to what it was like to witness the early pre-commercialized hip-hop culture. First, it's a mind state. You got to eliminate your perception of what you think hip-hop is, what you think commercialized hip-hop is, because there was none, did not exist. There were a lot of negative things occurring, happening in the town that I'm from. That's the Bronx, the Boogie Down. Yeah, it was pretty rough. I mean, from a socioeconomic, political perspective, the Bronx, as well as all of New York, actually, because uh, Mayor Beam had sent a request to Gerald Ford to get our bond issue situated They didn't do that. So from a fiscal perspective, New York was really doing bad and property owners were burning their buildings in the Bronx to um, get the insurance money and such. One of the biggest memorable moments I remember is watching a Yankee game and the announcer talking about the rooftop fires you could see during the game because Yankee Stadium is in the Bronx, and this is the old Yankee Stadium in the old Bronx. So we're talking about a a wicked time. And you know it's wicked when you can take equipment and set up to a lamppost in the middle of the street and cops don't come, okay? Mm. So (laughs) this this is the climate we're, we're talking about, but we took lemons and made lemon meringue pie. Four people from the Bronx invented a multi billion dollar industry from chaos. And that thing is called hip hop. So what was your first encounter with hip hop that made you just say, I got to do this. I got to be a part of it. Was it like parties or did you just hear somebody like freestyling on the street? What was that? Hip hop has a couple of elements. The first element of hip hop is graffiti. So from riding the train and just seeing the amazing graph from Dondi and Blaze and all these guys putting up this amazing artwork that was different than the artwork we saw before. There was a new energy interjected to it that you could tell was coming from an urban experience. Then the DJ, people like Who Herc and such, bringing that culture from Jamaica of the sound system to the Bronx and toasting, which was something that African-Americans has been doing forever, the marriage of toasting and sound systems to the block party that was occurring already was this perfect storm with the school system getting rid of music programs and such. 
And of course, the blackout in the 70s, because Mm -hmm. everybody wanted to be a DJ. Everybody wanted to have nice equipment, but it was expensive then. However, the playing field was kind of leveled with the blackout. All of a sudden, a lot of folks had great equipment. (laughs) And I think that uh, people won't say, but the blackout was one of the major contributors to uh, hip hop. Wow, I never knew that. Man. And so, because, you know, you couldn't afford those speakers and those, uh, a mixer and a microphone and turntables and all that. All of a sudden, we had it. <laughs> and then it was taking what was there before and re-energizing it. Yeah, you may have made that record in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, but we're going to take that record and we're going to reconceptualize it, recontextualize it. We're going to hip hop vaporize it and take it to another level that becomes a whole new art form that as a first generation hip hopper, we created. And so you got the DJ having the ingenuity to even know how to set up to a lamppost without getting electrocuted. Even knowing how to set up that equipment where there was no manuals, there was no uh, YouTube or lynda.com teaching you how to set up. These people were engineers in their own right. People like Flash, create a mixer, or how to set up and make your own speakers. And then of course, when you hear good music, you dance. You have the B-boys, the B-girls coming up with this whole new form of dance inspired by the karate movies that we used to check out. We love watching Bruce Lee and Iron Fist and Enter the Dragon and Five Deadly Venoms. And we will be coming out the movie theaters imitating those moves That somehow got pulled into the uh, the gumbo that is hip hop. Lastly, it was the MC. We never called ourselves rappers. We were MCs. We were nice on the mic, master ceremonies, mic controllers. You know, we never called ourselves rappers. With those elements combined together, along with knowledge itself, you have something we like to call hip hop. Poor black people, with the help of our Latino brothers and sisters, created a multi-billion dollar industry that if I told you in the early 80s that it would take over and be hotter than rock and roll, you would be like, I'm crazy. Who would have thunk it? So give us a sense of the vibe on the street. Was it pretty much a party vibe? There was a lot of pride you had to represent. You couldn't just hop on a microphone or DJ if you weren't like the best from your neighborhood because you was representing your neighborhood. You'd be like, yo, little Tommy, I know you want to get on the mic, but you ain't the best. Johnny here is the best because he was representing your hood, your squad, your crew. And so it had its built-in quality control and it was no money then. Whenever things are built upon a non-monetary system and it's based on skills, woo, steel sharpens steel. There were some amazing, talented brothers and sisters making it happen. So you had to bring something to the game. You couldn't just be getting up there and doing just any old thing. Yeah, because back then they had what's called ropes. You'd have your DJ set up in the park or on the street and he would have ropes. We didn't have velvet ropes. It'd be an extension cord rope or ropey rope rope, or there'll be some material used to separate the DJ from the audience. And it was very difficult to be allowed to go under those ropes. Not everybody was able to go under the ropes, be recognized as a participant in the culture, and then be able to participate. You can get beat down if you was whack. You can get beat down for trying to go into someone's ropes. It was that element to it too, because we just got off the gang era too, you gotta remember. New York was heavy into gangs. And another thing that really brought hip hop to the forefront was this was the antidote to that. People like Bambada was like, yo, let's form the Zulu Nation. And if you watch these early movies where they're breakdancing, it looks like they're going to fight, but they never really touch. That was intentional to stop the, the gang fighting that was you know, going on between the Black Spades and the Savage Skulls and the, you know, all these gangs that was uh, popular at the time. So you all had rules as well as enforcement. So there was something, as you say, intentional, positively intentional. Yeah, I mean, it was bringing smiles. The summer was amazing when hip hop was in its early days. You can go to different parks, Olinville Park, the Valley, you know, and just hear these amazing crews put out this new stuff that was the coolest thing out. R&B and soul and disco didn't really represent the sensibilities that this next era wanted to um, champion. And so it was a different take on the bravado and the energy and uh, it was something new. We built and created something new. 
Dig it. Tell us about the moment that you got inspired. What made you say, I got to get with this? The first thing, there was this guy named Disco King Mario, who was a DJ, and he would DJ at the park. And then when he would play records like Jimmy Caster's It's Just Begun, or Apache, or The Mexican, the whole audience would form a circle around these people, and they would start to first up rock, and then when the break hit, they would hit the ground. And they were like royalty. They were community superstars. These were platinum people. And you wanted to be like them, you know, and they were doing magical moves. And it was like, wow. And so either you want to be a break dancer or you want to be the, uh, the DJ. The MC came later. Mm -hmm. and so once the MC came, that was a whole different thing because the MC, his job was to promote the DJ. It wasn't even about you. It was about, yo, we got a party. Come out. Check us out. My DJ's the best. He got skills. He slices and dices better than your guy. Then all of a sudden, people start incorporating rhymes and routines and dance steps. And the MC started to get more and more and more prominence. But in the beginning, the DJ was the most important member and was the foundation of hip hop because the DJ owned the equipment, knew how to put the equipment together, and typically was the one who was recruiting people for his crew. Okay. Tell us about the birth of Mexi Ray. Well, for me, it was all about my older brother. I have an older brother. My mother would say, you can go to wherever you're going, but bring your little brother with you. I was like in heaven because my brother's best friends were DJs. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a house with a basement and we would go to this basement and I would be like, yo, I got rhymes. And they'd be like, yeah, get out of here, get out of here. But as time went on, my rhymes got better and my brother was, became an MC with the crew and then I followed suit. And then I became, you know, the M D E D X E I D R D A D Y. You know, that's how Mexi Ray came into existence because of my brother. Apollo One. We was with a crew called Touch of Class, and we were the nice and nasty MCs. And we were good. <laughs> we put it down. We made a mark. Cool. Do you remember any particular stories that have a special place in your heart? I guess for me, just being able to be a participant and being a first generation hip hopper and being able to go to the clubs that made hip hop. People don't realize about the T Connection and the Stardust Ballroom and the Celebrity Club and the Renaissance. And there were all these venues that you can go to. So just the experience of going into the T Connection, walking up them steps and watching a crew like the Cold Crush Brothers or the Brothers Disco or Grand Wizard Theater and the Fantastic Romantic Five MCs give you a performance or a show or to watch a battle. To watch a real live battle, oh my goodness. And the first battles were really on sound systems. Who had the loudest sound system? In the cafeteria, if you had a boom box, and I had that new JVC that took like the 8 to 12D batteries, and you had the little one that only had like 4C batteries, I'd blast you out in the cafeteria. <laughs> Same thing in the parks. It was not about anything else, but who had the loudest sound system. And that's how the first battle started. Then it became not only the best sound system, whose DJ had the best skills. Then it was whose DJ and MCs were the best. Then it became who had the best crew. Then, as records came about, it became who had the most sales. And once you add commercialism into the mix and you lose that quality control, you have the beginning of a separation between hip-hop culture and rap culture, which are two different things. Okay, you want to go deeper on that? Well, basically, if you're doing something to make yourself better, your people better, your community better, you're doing a hip-hop thing. If you're doing something to make money, to become famous, to get paid and make a lot of money, that's like a rap thing. You know, you want to have all the jewelries and all the girls. If you look at a rap blueprint that says, if you say these words and you disrespect these people and you believe in this system, you'll make money. A rapper would do it, whereas an MC is going to do something that, A, make sure his skills are correct. And then after your skills are correct, you're going to do something to push the culture along. You sent me a link to a YouTube video where speech from Arrested Development was touching upon rap culture a little bit. That's rap culture he's talking about, not so much hip hop culture. Right. And people don't realize there's a difference, you know. 
They don't remember because they weren't exposed to it. You have second, third, fourth generation hip hop who never been exposed to real hip hop. They only been exposed to it on TV, BET, and on the radio and such. So that's the problem, the disconnect. Okay. Let's talk about the opposition to hip hop culture in the early days. It's just like it is whenever something new's coming. People hate change. People hate something new. And it was championed by young people. And in this case, young urban people. And so anytime anything is championed by young urban people, it's going to be met with resistance. And the things that we were doing, the things that we were saying, we had our own way of dressing. We had our own way of talking. And so if you was outside that environment, it was perceived as foreign. And people were scared of foreign stuff. And so it was all these things that even till this day, because of the melanin content of hip hop, it's scary to some people. There's a clip in a video from the Converse sneaker battle tour where someone was being interviewed and mentioned how people thought hip hop was silly. And there she was standing on a red carpet getting ready to go into this big hip hop event. It was, you know, just amazing that particular event showing you how far hip hop has come. And the reason I was there was because I owned the world's largest hip hop flyer collection. As a young person, whenever I went to a party, I would keep the flyer because they were amazing to me. Flyers are a way to market and promote and advertise. So before social networking, before all the things that young people have now, that was our way of street marketing. That was our way of getting the word out via the flyer. So to see your name on a flyer, and then uh, with the advent of the Xerox machine, as they got more sophisticated, you were able to get pictures on a flyer. Wow, my picture on a flyer that I could distribute and circulate and market and promote was an amazing thing. And, and there were only a handful of flyer makers who were at the very top, from your Buddy Esquires to your Danny Tongues to your Anthony Rileys to your Phase Threes to your Cisco's, to your tailor maids. There were not a lot of flyer makers, so it was an honor to be able to do a hip hop party at one of the hip hop venues and then have a real flyer maker make your flyer. One of the most prolific would be Buddy Esquire, King of the Flyer, RIP, who was amazing. And this was before computers. These are all made by hand. So you didn't just collect flyers that had your name on them. You collected a whole bunch of them. Wherever you were from, I wanted to know who you were, what your crew was about, and that was my way of doing research. Plus, from the aesthetic, flyers have their own hip hop aesthetic that's beautiful from indicating the style of the day, you know, the bubble coats, the jeans sensation. Jeans were being pushed to the forefront then from your Jordas and your Sergios and your Calvin Klein and Vanderbilt to your, your jewelry you wore, to your townhouse medallions or to your rope chains or to your big bamboo shrimp earrings or the ski goggles or Kazal glasses. It impacted fashion, every other thing that we could touch in an amazing way. You look today, people like Dapper Dan are working with Versace and Louis Vuitton. But, you know, we was doing that way before they recognized that we were manipulating fashion and pushing it forward. So hip hop comes out of the hood. It becomes mainstream. And you find that you have something valuable in those flyers. Tell us about the genesis of getting the flyers together as a touring exhibition. Basically, I get a call from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They asked if they could do a tour to various museums with the flyers, and they wanted to acquire them from me. And I did a situation where I put them on loan for a few, and you know, they got. And once they got appraised by Sotheby's and Christie's and all that, I was like, oh, this is real. And then I saw what they did with it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That inspired me to one day do my own thing, and that was one of the reasons why I started something called the Hip Hop Culture Center. We would use hip hop to bring young people in and really help celebrate the culture as well as educate young people. Tell me some of the cities that the Flyer exhibition went to, L.A., D.C., where else? Cleveland, where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is located, of course, New York. It traveled to foreign countries, Japan. I mean, it, there's actually a permanent collection at uh, Cornell University as we speak. My daughter and I were reminiscing uh, a few days ago, talking about uh, going to D.C. on the um, sneaker battle tour because she came with me. And she said what a great time uh, she had, what fond memories she had of that trip. Us getting in bed with Converse was fun. We did something called the Converse sneaker battle. And this was before 
everybody else was doing sneaker battles. We were at the forefront, pitched the concept of taking plain white Converse and having uh, young people design them with the idea whoever has the best design gets their own sneaker deal. We were able to get uh, about seven people sneaker deals that hit the market at Foot Locker and Champs and other stores. The sneakers done were unique. They were amazing, custom crafted. And then to watch them go from uh, being designed in a park or at a club to being sold at a place of commerce was a, a, something pretty cool to watch. Yeah, I remember going to some of those venues and shooting video of the artists making the shoes. And there was some amazing talent there. Not only amazing talent, but you had tools from Sharpies all the way up to airbrushes. Just showing the ingenuity and the talent that if you put into a positive environment can be coached out of people. It's pretty um, amazing. You had other events going on as well. You'd have dancers and uh, talk about some of the other events that were going on adjacent to the Sneaker Battle Tour and the Hip Hop Flyer exhibition. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, we had concerts. Uh, I believe Kanye was there and a bunch of um, reigning hip hop royalty at the time was present. You know, we had amazing like after party red carpet, but we also had uh, instructional things going on. We actually, there was actually a break dance competition and it's rare to go to a hip hop exhibition and for some real hip hop to be going on. Let's talk about the Hip Hop Culture Center in Harlem. What was the genesis for you wanting to start that? My way of giving back, I, I've been blessed. I've been able to do pretty decent uh, as far as business. I was looking at my community and I felt that this was the first generation of young black people who may not do better than a generation before. And what was I going to do about it? And the Hip Hop Culture Center was my way of creating a community and a safe place for young people to go and express themselves. Right there at the Magic Johnson Theater. Right on 125th Street, across the street from the Apollo. I've done programming for over 150,000 uh, young people. I produced and created over 500 events. The thing that I'm most proud of, we've never had a fight, never been a shootout. We did over 10,000 hours of work, and it's never been no beef because we were blessed with a lot of love. That was a pretty special and perfect time. And one of the events you had were the first ever 24-hour rap-a-thons. There was no cursing, no misogyny. Talk a little about that. Often imitated, but never duplicated rap-a-thon. The rap -thon was a situation where we would have to interview 500 MCs just to see if we can get 125 who would be down to rock for 24 hours straight, nonstop. The longest we've done was 28 hours, because every year we would add an hour to it. I was able to meet some amazing people who participated and some amazing DJs who spun the records for the MCs to, to rhyme to. It was a way to create extended family. If you participated in a rapathon, the brothers and sisters who participated with you are family. And that's for life. During that premiere week of the Hip Hop Culture Center, that was a huge family party. You had Cool Herc, Melly Mel, Grand Wizard Theodore, Ralph McDaniels. That was an amazing week. Talk about the feeling of that week. It's pure adrenaline. Just to be able to watch your baby come to life, to be able to be hands on and controlling your own destiny. A lot of times folks don't get to control their own destiny, but to take something from conception to endpoint and see it happen the way you want it to happen and then have people respond favorably to it. Beautiful. And then the center birthed a lot of events that you're a part of now that you've created, like the Rappacons, the DJ Cons. Tell us about some of those events that you were doing there. That was our specialty, coming up with events. I mean, we've done TV shows like MCDMC, where we have everyone from the 4SMDs to Roxanne Chate to Naughty by Nature come by and perform. Uh, we did our events like Art, Rhyme, and Wine which were um, beautiful events where people would come and participate, look at the artwork, have MCs rhyme about the artwork, all while having a wine tasting contest. It was, it was beautiful. Um, Singers Lounge, where we would just do events to promote folks who were singing, who could hit notes, who wanted to express themselves in that manner. So it was a very inclusive place that was just a community that we invented for creativity. And we did everything from movie premieres to 
dance competitions to bar mitzvahs. I mean, it's amazing. Weddings. I mean, it was an amazing venue because we had, it was uh, 10,000 square feet. So it was huge. And it was uh, in the heart of 125th Street. I can't name any longer all the events that we did or the luminaries who came through. I'm just thinking now from Karis One to Fat Joe to Immortal Technique to Grand Wizard Theater. I mean, it was it was pretty sick. DJ Breakout. I, I can go on and on and on. You know, I remember seeing Ice T once on stage and all, all these mm. different people who you look up to to be able to do business with them. What was great? Tell us about the uh, edutainment events that you had for young people because that was pretty significant. And that was really the heart. That was the foundation, using hip hop to bring young people in, then teaching them economic literacy, political awareness, diet and nutrition, employment 101. Being able to use hip hop as an educational tool was really what I hang my hat on and was the element of the center that I'm most proud of. Any specific memories that are close to your heart in the center while it was around? This is too many. It's almost like, um, about what's the best thing about being 16? I mean, <laughs> everything. Right. I'm 16, yo. It's like, All right. it's just, yeah, so it, it was everything. If I had to say, the center had this gobo, gobo light that said Hip Hop Culture Center. So when you turned the lights on, this gobo would come on mm -hmm. and the whole community would see it and they would know the place was open. So you never knew who was gonna come through those doors. You would just be having a meeting all of a sudden, oh snap, is that Red Alert? Is, you know, it was just amazing to see, oh, is that Cool Hurt coming through the doors? You know, is that the Cold Crush Brothers coming through the doors? Is that Tony Tone? People would just come through the doors. I remember one time Magic Johnson just came through the doors. Man. You know, it wasn't scheduled, it wasn't planned. Magic was like, yo, what's going on up in here? You know, simple, simple as that. So I guess it, it was that element of it. That was that shining beacon that attracted people to the lighthouse of the Hip Hop Culture Center in Harlem. It was the bat signal, bro. <laughs> the bat signal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what advice would you give to newcomers to the game? Be competent. And then once you're competent, you have the right to be confident. And when you mix competency with confidence, there's no stopping you. And a lot of times people just get in with hip hop on the confidence. Their competency is not there. And so learn your history. Know where this thing called hip hop comes from. Study its pioneers. Learn who was the best. And then strategize your lane. Seek out the, the confidence. Okay. One of the questions I like to ask people is why they got into music. What's your why for getting into hip hop and for embracing music the way that you have? There was just nothing cooler. What's cooler than taking words and flipping them to tell a story that can make people laugh, that can make people reflect? To me, what is a true telltale sign if something is hip hop or not is how long it lasts. If you write a rhyme and your rhyme is disposable or only hot for one summer, to me, that's not hip hop. But if you write a rhyme that can last and take test of time, you know, you're really doing it. Like one of the people I looked up to in hip hop was Melly Mel. And I remember when he said one of his rhymes, I could say it today and it still resonates. He said, a child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but he's frowning too. Cause only God knows what you'll go through. You can go up in the ghetto, live in second rate and your eyes will see assault and deep hate. Places you play and where you stay looks like one great big alleyway, but you'll admire all the number book takers is dopes, pimps, and pushes in the big money makers, dropping big cars, spending 20s and 10s, and you want to grow up to be just like them. Hustlers, gamblers, burglars, scramblers, pickpockets, peddlers, even panhandlers. You say, I'm cool, huh? I'm no fool, but then you wind up dropping out of high school. Now you're unemployed, all non void, walking around like your pretty boy Floyd. Turn stick up, kid. Look what you done did. Got sent up for an eight year bid. Now your manhood's took. You're a made tax, but the next 10 years as an undercover fat being used and abused, served like hell, to one day they find your body hung dead in a cell. It was plain to see that your life was lost. You was cold and your body swung back and forth. But now I say you heard that song, how you live so fast and die so young, as opposed to do the stinky leg, do the stinky leg, do the stinky <laughs> You can't even compare. It's like, come on, man. I struggle just to write lyrics to like a preconceived song. I really have a lot of respect for people who can just spit out rhymes just like nothing. And it's an extension of Afrocentricity, which was something else that I loved about hip hop. I know that modern day MCs or griots, we are taking the culture from Africa coupled with the drum 
and we're doing what we've always done. Yep, and using technology to the advantage of the message. Indubitably. Now, before we go, actually, um, I want you to uh, talk about one of your latest projects, Curtis Sherrod's Top 3. Basically, it's a, a TV show that I've been working on that I'm, I'm really enjoying, and it's being able to talk to people regardless of what their skill sets are, regardless of what their strengths are, and really finding out what's their top three in regards to their particular niche. It's a fun show. It's a cool show. And if you get the chance, check us out. Yeah, I'll provide the link in the show notes as uh, well as any other stuff that you're up to these days. Well, my brother, thank you so much. I get a contact high of knowledge just standing next to this brother. You're far too kind. Thank you, thank you. You're far too kind. <laughs> no, nah, man, it's the truth. I've really enjoyed this conversation as I enjoy all the conversations we have. Thanks so much for coming on, Curtis Sherrod. Take it easy, man. Back at you, man. The pleasure was mine. I'll catch you next episode. Back in the day, I was familiar with The Last Poets and Gil Scott Heron, but when I heard Grandmaster Flash's The Message, it felt like a whole new thing. When I moved to New York and attended the JVC Jazz Festival, I started seeing some jazz artists incorporate MCs into the mix. Next thing you know, pop artists began incorporating hip-hop rhyming and rappers into their songs. Video Music Box was on public access as well as on cable TV, which was increasing in popularity. As with the civil rights struggle, there are generations coming up that have not grown up experiencing original hip-hop culture. So, reviewing history is important. My thanks again to first-generation hip-hopper Curtis Sherrod for sharing a bit of history with us. To experience some of Curtis's work, check out the show notes at phildonaldson.com slash one. That's phildonaldson.com slash O-N-E. Thanks so much for listening to the On The One podcast. If you like what you've heard, please spread the word and tell your friends. You can subscribe to On The One on the major podcast directories. I'm your host, Phil Donaldson, and as always, you can reach me at phil at phildonaldson.com. Until next time, may you find your superpower, fuel your passion, and light it up.